a teacher told her young class to ask their parents for a family story with a moral at the end of it and to return the next day and tell their stories. So the, the, this one guy's name is Joe. He gave this example first. He's my dad's a farmer and we have chickens. One day we we're taking uh, lots of eggs to the market in a basket on the front seat of the truck. We hit a big bump in the road. The basket fell off the seat and all the eggs broke. The moral of the story is not to put all your eggs in one basket. Very good, said the teacher. Next turn was Mary. And she said, we are farmers too. We had 20 eggs waiting to hatch. But when they did, we only got 10 chicks. The moral of the story is not to count your chickens before they're hatched. Very good, said the teacher. Very pleased with the response so far. Next, it was Barney's turn to tell his story. He says, my dad told me this story about my Aunt Karen. Karen was a flight engineer in the war and her plane got, got hit and she had to bail out over enemy territory. And all she had was a Bible, a machine gun, and a machete. Go on, said the teacher, sort of intrigued. Aunt Karen read the verse in the Bible on the way down. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And she read that to prepare herself. Then she landed right in the middle of a hundred enemy soldiers. She killed 70 of them with the machine gun until she ran out of bullets. Then she killed 20 more with a machete till the blade broke. And then she finished off the last 10 with her bare hands. Good heavens, a horrified teacher said. What did your father say was the moral of that frightening story? And he said, don't mess with Aunt Karen when she's been reading the Bible. <laughs> Psalm 16, verse five through eight says this, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. With the Lord at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity just to bring these morsels from your word, the truth of your word, into the family today. And we pray that you will guide it to where it needs to go and that it will accomplish what you want it to accomplish in each life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this happened after Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10. You recall Peter's vision where a sheet was let down from heaven and there were all kinds of animals in there and Peter was hungry and God said, kill and eat that vision. Well, this now happened after that vision. Now there's a persecution by King Herod. And he has had James, the brother of John, executed with a sword. Since the execution pleased the Jews, and when it says that, it means the Jewish leaders. They're talking about the Jewish authorities. Herod has had Peter arrested also. In verse 4, we see how important a person Peter was to them. Sixteen guards for one fisherman. Sixteen guards. So we pick it up in verse number 5, Acts, 12, Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The church was praying. The church was praying. This is important. One of the roles of the church is to pray, earnestly pray for those who are having any kind of problems and, and 
They were earnestly praying. They were specifically praying. It was focused prayer about Peter being in prison. And not only that, since he had executed James, they were probably going to execute him too. That's probably what their design was in all of this. So they were praying. There is a persecution going on. There is danger. One of their believers has been executed, has been killed. An important one. You know, every believer is important. Every believer is important. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Peter seems to be their leader at this point. I don't know how many years after the crucifixion this was, but they no doubt loved Peter. The execution of James, the brother of John, had just happened, and the brethren were rightfully concerned. So the church went to prayer. That's what the church ought always to do, go to prayer. Of all the reactions they could have had, they could have gone home, they could have ran away, they could have left town. But the one thing they did was to go to prayer. The church prayed. And they were still praying when Peter arrived at the home where they were praying. Have you ever prayed for an hour, two hours, or more about the same thing? I never have. I've prayed for an hour, but all kinds of things. But they were praying for one thing, focused prayer for one thing. And at that time, they were praying for Peter. In verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard, stood guard at the entrance. He's just a fisherman. He's not a revolutionary, although they probably looked at all the believers as revolutionaries. But they put two chains on him so he couldn't move, sleeping between two guards and sentries posted at the gates. They're not taking any chances. They want to make sure he goes to trial in the morning and probably executed right immediately after. That's how they did things. They weren't taking any chances. God loves to set us free when the odds seem overwhelming. He loves to set us free when it looks like nothing can happen. He often comes to our aid at the last minute. Sometimes things look pretty bleak. Where are you, Lord? But he comes when there was nowhere else to turn. It was impossible for Peter to get away. He couldn't escape the imprisonment. Or the impending execution it was impossible. God specializes in things that are not possible in the natural. So picture these Israelites when they were up against the Red Sea when Moses was leading them out of, out of Egypt. Pharaoh's coming with 600, it says, of his best chariots and all the rest of the chariots also. And commanders. And they were up against the sea. Things looked pretty gloomy. Same thing with Peter. Suddenly, an angel, in verse 7, appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. You know, maybe Peter was a really sound sleeper. Or maybe this angel was a rude angel. But it seems it was necessary for the angel to smack Peter, struck him on the side, to get him to wake up. Would you be sleeping real soundly if you're between two soldiers and had two chains on you? I don't sleep real well without any soldiers or chains tossing and turning at night. 
and with the possibility of a trial the next day and maybe have your head removed from the rest of you. But he was sleeping soundly. A light came in that didn't bother him. And so this angel smacks him, <laughs> punches him on his side to get him awake. The Lord really does work in mysterious ways. Verse 8, then the angel said to him, put in your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. This is one of the few, maybe one of the only times that I read in the Bible that an angel doesn't scare somebody. Usually they have to say, fear not, you know. But he doesn't say that. He says, wake up and get your clothes on. We're out of here. He, doesn't, he, doesn't, he didn't scare Peter. He just punched him. So he gets dressed. And get dressed. We got to go. Peter has to get prepared for a flight. He has to get prepared quickly. Bring your cloak because we're not coming back here. Bring your cloak. So Peter had been really, rudely awakened. Rudely. It seems that he really didn't know what was going on. Maybe he was still half asleep, a little groggy from his sound sleep. But in verse 9, Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea what the angel was doing or what was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. In verse 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them all by itself. One miracle after another. His chains fell away. The soldiers that were sleeping by him didn't wake up. And now the gates are just opening all by themselves. And they went through when they had awake when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. So the angel leaves when he accomplishes his task, when he finishes what he was sent there to do. This unnamed angel goes back to home in heaven, probably back to worship until he gets another assignment. Maybe he's going to punch somebody else. <laughs> Maybe that's what he specializes in, smacking people. I don't know. But in other words, God has sent the angel to rescue uh, Peter's thinking, me from certain death. And God must have more ministry for me to accomplish for him. So Peter came to himself and he said, now I know without a doubt the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. And then in verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. John Mark was the author of the Gospel of Mark. It's confusing because they called him John Mark, but that was Mark. There were, there were many people uh, where many people had gathered and were praying. So they were still praying in the middle of the night for Peter. Verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda. Rhoda is famous in all of history because of this. She came to answer the door when she recognized Peter's voice. She was so overjoyed. She ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. And she was so happy to hear his voice that she left him standing out there. She had to go in and tell him that Peter's at the door. Verse 15, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept on insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. It's verse 16, but Peter kept knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. They thought nobody could escape Herod's clutches. But Peter demonstrated persistence. Just because Rhoda didn't let him in, he wasn't going to give up. In verse 17, Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. So they must have been in there chattering and making all kinds of noise and carrying on. He said, hey, quiet down and listen to what I got to say here. Quiet. 
And he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He described it. Tell James and the other brothers. Now this is a different James than the one that was executed, obviously. And sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Some things about this. Number one, Peter was under a serious threat. From all appearances, he was likely to be killed for doing God's bidding, and it was going to happen the next day. This threat was imminent. God's people have always been under a threat in one place or another. Even if they're not going to kill you, Satan comes after you in one way or another and anyway. There's always a threat for those who carry the gospel. All down through history, opposition to the gospel has always been there. Satan doesn't want the message to spread. And he does have power and he's a god of this world. He knows about the power that operates through God's word. And he does everything he can to stop, to silence the gospel. In North Korea, Christians in North Korea must worship the nation's leader. What they call the dear leader. And belonging to another religion makes you an enemy of the state and thousands of them have been imprisoned and many tortured and executed. Believers must meet secretly at the risk of arrest and death in North, North Korea. In Somalia, Islam is the state religion and converting to another religion is illegal in Somalia. The Islamist group Al-Shabaab has stated that it wants to rid Somalia of all Christians and people suspected of following the faith are likely to be killed on the spot. Many people in secret, um, many meet in secret or don't meet at all and they cannot own Bibles. They just, they kill you. They kill you. In Iraq, many Christians fled Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein and persecution escalated. As Islamic, as Islamic State has taken control of large parts of that country, Christians and other minorities have been forced to convert, to pay a punitive tax or be killed. An estimated 100,000 people fled their homes in Mosul a city in a largely Christian region in northern Iraq as ISIS advanced on the region in 2014. There have been public execution style killings of Christians by ISIS, some of them recorded and broadcast for propaganda purposes, and most of the churches have been demolished. Syria, an estimated 700,000 Christians have fled Syria since the start of the civil war in 2011. Parts of the country have been claimed by ISIS. Christians are often abducted and killed. United States, we're getting pretty close to persecution. Our own beloved country is unrecognizable from when it was called a Christian nation. Speak against certain behaviors that are condemned in the Bible and your freedom of speech could go away. They call the Bible hate speech. The opposition is everywhere and it's increasing even in our own country. Romans 1, 6 to, 1 16 to 17 For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jews then to the Gentiles for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last just as it is written the righteous will live by faith We have just a real as enemy as Peter did. Our 
enemy is just as real. You don't see him, but you see what he's doing if you pay attention. <clears throat> First Peter 5, 8 and 9, be alert and a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, <clears throat> looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So we need, just as Peter's fellow believers did, to be in prayer for the persecuted believers around the world. We need to be in prayer. Number two, God will remove your chains. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In Galatians 5, 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And that yoke of slavery is the yoke of sin. The yoke of sin. There was no way that Peter could free himself. Herod had him bound securely. Two soldiers, two chains, sentries. Christians have chains too. We can be bound in chains of our own making. Self-esteem shouldn't have such a hold on us that we can't keep on sharing the gospel. Feelings of inadequacy, like I can't do that. What are your chains? What keeps you from doing ministry? Peter wasn't able to do ministry when he was in the chains. But the chains fell away. The angel didn't touch the chains. The angel was only there to wake Peter and lead him out of the prison. You know, we need to ask God. We need to ask God to help us to emerge from whatever binds us and holds us in from carrying the gospel in a personal way. Number three, Peter wasn't able to escape while he was asleep. <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't escape while he was sleeping. He must have been a sound sleeper. Maybe a demon kept him sleeping. He needed a smack of an angel to wake him up. The Holy Spirit sometimes smacks us <laughs> to an alert state. Have you ever been there? I've been there. Sometimes you need a smack. Wake up. i got a thing for you to do here. A startling something happens, and as a result, you can't you can see uh, that God wants you to do something. Number four, Peter didn't give up just because the door wasn't open to him at first. When Rhoda came to the door, he didn't give up. Rhoda didn't let him in, but he kept on knocking. Let me in. <laughs> it's me. It's Peter. Many people have been saved because somebody kept on knocking on their door. Myself included. The Holy Spirit knocks on your door. Have you been, knock have you been knocking on somebody's door? He kept knocking. I remember, I probably told this before because it was... It was pretty amazing when I was at Lock Haven High School photographing seniors one year. A girl came down. I had a little studio set up in the wrestling room. And she came down. She said, I'm not going to buy any pictures because I'm saving all my money to go on a mission trip. I said, good for you. That's, that's awesome. And then the next day, another girl came down there, and she said, I'm not going to buy any pictures because I'm saving all my money to go on a mission trip. I said, are you going on a trip with that girl who was here yesterday? And she said, yes. She said, and you should have seen me a month ago. She says, I had purple hair 
black makeup on, a razor blade around my neck, and a body full of drugs. And that first girl wouldn't give up on her. Just kept knocking, inviting her to church. Wouldn't give up on her. The first girl wasn't what you would call an attractive person. And I don't know what it was. She was just driven by the Holy Spirit to make this girl a project of faith and of prayer. And she kept knocking. And that girl told me, she said, I, oh, she says, I'm on fire for God now. Instead of drugs and whatever she was into. And that other girl was her best buddy now. Totally incongruous to people. Totally different people. How God does things. Because she wouldn't give up. She kept on knocking. Knocking. And I told this before, and I told it at Bible study this Wednesday night, but at, at one time I was a backslider. I fell away from the fellowship with God and, and with church. I was in that condition for three years. And I was photographing a young man, a bald eagle area senior. senior. And I always asked the kids what they were going to do. And he said, I'm going to be a youth pastor. And I said, oh, really? He said, what fellowship are you with? He said, Assembly of God. And that stopped me in my tracks. And I said, you know, I wish I could tell you that I'm in the Assembly of God. But I said, I walked away. I said, I'm out of fellowship with God. I'm out of fellowship with God's people. He looked me right in the eye. He said, you need to get back. 17-year-old kid, maybe 16. I said, I know I do. And he said, I'll be praying for you. And all during the school year, every time I was in school, I would be photographing candidates for the yearbook or whatever. If I ran across him, he'd look at me and say, well. <laughs> and I said, not yet, but don't give up on me. And he said, I will never give up on you. So much maturity for a kid like that. He didn't know it, but I was suicidal then. My wife didn't even know. His words kept me alive on the planet. I talked to him about four years. He's, 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 he's a, an Assembly of God pastor, has four churches. One of them is the Freedom Life Church down in Milesburg, down by the Bald Eagle High School. That used to be the Milesburg Assembly of God. And they were struggling down there. And uh, they asked him if he, would, if he would take over that church. And they gave up their own 5013C, came under his authority, and he got them all straightened out. But I talked to him on the phone because I had never told anybody that. I said, your words kept me alive. And that's true. But he wouldn't give up. And a year later, I was photographing a girl at Belfont High School, blonde girl, and she looked up at me and she said, I know who you are. You're the backslidden photographer that we pray for every week in our youth group. So she was at this church and he had those kids praying for me relentlessly for a whole year. Can you imagine that? Well, it took a couple more years, but after three years, you know, when you get saved, it's a miracle. When you come back from being a backslider, it's a miracle. And I was photographing at Lock Haven High School again. And I used to stay away from home. I'd, I'd, I'd work from 9 in the morning until 9 at night. And then I would just get a motel room. I'd stay maybe two nights and go home on a third night. And I was there at night and the kids weren't showing up and I put my head down on a rickety card table that I had my little office set up in. And I said, out loud, I just wish I could go home. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, you're not ever going home. He said, I'm your father and your home is here in heaven, but you won't ever see it if you keep going the way you're going. So I went to my motel room at the end of the day and repented and Sunday morning I was in the home church. 
And God said to me, I will not strive with you again, boy. This is your last chance. Teenagers wouldn't give up on me. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep knocking. With God, you are unstoppable. Many people have been saved because somebody wouldn't give in on them or give up with them. You got to be alert. You got to be alert to what the enemy is doing. He tries to stop you. But you can do anything that God calls you to do. He, he, he equips those who he calls. The devil tries to make you think that you can't do that. Just like Moses. I can't do that. Get somebody else. Then you stop trying. Don't stop. Keep knocking. Be persistent. Don't be obnoxious. You drive them away. Just be persistent. And know that there is a great threat against you. God will remove your chains. Whatever is binding you and keeping you from sharing the gospel. God will remove the chains. Wake up without somebody punching you in the side. Be alert. Don't give up. Be persistent. That's the heart of my message today. Wake up. See what's going on around you. Your precious friends and family are lost. And you might not be the one to bring them back, but you might be part of it. You might be planting the seed. You might be watering. But be persistent. Not obnoxious. There's a difference. Keep knocking. Gently. Gently. Well, I've preached this before. God's not done with us. He, you know, <laughs> if I, I'll preach it again. I just think it's what we need to be and need to do. So, would you stand? I need to see the board members for a few minutes. My office out there. Dear Lord, we thank you today. You are the awesome, beautiful, loving, powerful God. And you care about us no matter how we feel you, Lord, you care about us anyway. And we pray for your empowerment of your Holy Spirit to come upon us like we've never seen it before. We pray for the guidance and leadership that we need to prosper this church, Lord. I'm talking about prosperity and souls. So as we go our separate ways, bring us back together safely the next time we meet, Lord. And stay with us in our thoughts and our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to all of you, my friends.